All right. First Kings chapter 14, we're getting up to the, uh, we're seeing the end of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat's reign. Of course, we know he's known all throughout the Bible as a standard of a wicked king, someone who, who made the, the golden calves, the, the idols for the children of Israel to worship right at the time the, the, the nation of Israel split into two nations. You had the southern kingdom of Judah and then the northern kingdom of, of Israel, which, which was the majority of the, of the nation was that, that bigger country of, uh, of Israel. And uh, let's, let's jump right into this. Look at the first three verses here. I've got a couple of main points I'm going to preach on tonight. One is the, this main story where um, Jeroboam sends his wife because his son's sick to go inquire of the, of the man of God, to go prior, inquire of a prophet. And then, and then of course, um, he, he ends up being cursed, and, and we'll, read it, we'll, we'll go over all that. And then there's something else that comes up a little bit later in the chapter I want to spend some time on as well. So let's jump right in here. Look at verses number 1 through 3. The Bible says, At that time Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, fell sick. And Jeroboam said to his wife, Arise, I pray thee, and disguise thyself, that thou be not known to be the wife of Jeroboam, and get thee to Shiloh. Behold, there is Ahijah the prophet, which told me that I should be king over this people, and take with thee ten loaves and cracknels and a cruise of honey, and go to him. He shall tell thee what shall become of the child. Now, there's so many things just right off the bat here I want to point out, and that's why I started off with a little brief introduction of Jeroboam and what we've seen earlier with him. He's someone that, he mentions Ahijah here, Ahijah the prophet. Ahijah is the one that first came up to Jeroboam while Solomon was still king. Solomon was reigning, he's the king. Ahijah comes up to Jeroboam and he says, look, you're going to get, you know, the kingdom's going to be divided, it's going to be rent. He was the guy, you remember, that, that came up to him, uh, Jeroboam had that brand new you know, uh, jacket on, a coat, and Ahijah comes and he slices it up into 12 parts. And it's like, whoa, yo, like, what are you doing? You're slicing up my brand new garment. But, and, and he's saying, you know, the kingdom's going to be divided. There's going to be 11 going to you, and one's going to remain with the house of David. And he says, it's not going to happen in Solomon's days, but in his son's days. So Rehoboam becomes king. He says, kingdom's going to be divided, and you're going to be the king. And he tells him, you, you know, if you follow the God's commandments, if, you, if you're a godly king, if you, if you listen and heed, take heed to the commandments of the Lord, You'll be like David. He'll build and establish your house and he'll, you know, and he'll really bless you. And those, that was the, the prophecy that Ahijah gave unto Jeroboam. Of course, the things that the prophet spake came to pass. When Rehoboam became king, Jeroboam approaches him and, and says, hey, you know, he was kind of the leader of, of a bunch of people that, that came and asking King uh, Rehoboam, you know, your father gave us a, a really grievous burden to bear. He made our yoke heavy. You know, we, we've been doing all this work for King Solomon. Can you just ease up on us a little bit? Can you lighten the load? And of course, Rehoboam forsook the, the wise counsel of the old men and went with the counsel of the young men and told them, no, shortly. I mean, he, he, he said, he's going to go, I said, I'm going to make it even harder on you. You know, he chastised you with whips. I'm going to chastise you with scorpions. That was his answer. He answered them roughly. And so they're like, fine, forget you. You know, see to your own house, you house of David. We're going to go and do our own thing. And then, of course, you know, Jeroboam was kind of leading that. And all the people said, you know what? We want Jeroboam to be king. So that was the split of the kingdom. Everything was happening the way that the prophets said they were going to happen. Jeroboam, of all people, should know, hey, Ahijah's a prophet of the Lord. Hey, the Lord's not someone to be messing around with because the whole reason I even became king is because Solomon was forsaking the Lord. And Solomon's the one building up these altars under these false gods. And now it's come to me because of what Solomon did. He was told that. And then what do we see? Right away, Jeroboam setting up these altars, building these, these golden calves, and building false gods. It's like, what do you think is going to happen? And then last week we saw where the man of God came and prophesied against the altar and he pro prophesied about Josiah and, and everything that was going to come to pass in the future. But what's interesting, now we see, okay, however much time has gone past, I don't know, but we see here Jeroboam, his son, falls sick, Abijah. Now, I, I just thought this was kind of interesting that his, his son's name is Abijah and Ahijah is the name of the prophet. I have no idea if there's any, you know, if those words mean any, you know, if they're real similarly related or not. 
it could be extremely different even just off of one one letter but i thought that that was kind of interesting that maybe he he named him similarly to ahijah because of the prophecy received i don't know just just speculating on that but his son gets sick does he turn to the fall to the to the golden calves he made no of course not. He knows that they're just the, the work of men's hands. He knows the reason why he made them is just because he was worried about losing the kingdom and people going back and returning to Jerusalem and, and, and going back to the house of David and Rehoboam being king. But he wants to know what's going on. So here we see kind of a, a down and out Jeroboam, someone who now all of a sudden has a great need. See, when he, when he became king, what does he need God for, right? He'll just make his own gods. When everything's going smooth and cool in his life, and hey, everything's going great, we're winning our battles, you know, what do you need God for? This is the attitude a lot of people have today, you know. You got, you got your two cars, you got your house, you got your kids, you got your family, you got a good job, everything's going good, what do you need God for? Until something happens in your life. Until your son gets cancer. Or, you know, some, some deathly sickness, some disease. Now all of a sudden he's worried. Now all of a sudden he's saying, oh, uh, here's something I can't do about this. I need to go, I need to go see God. And that's what he does. And, and, and notice how he says, he, he sends his wife, first of all. He can't go himself. He's, he's too ashamed or embarrassed to go himself. He has to send his wife and he tells his wife to disguise herself. Like, don't let anyone, don't let anyone see you're, you're going to ask the prophet something. Don't let anyone see you going into that church. What would people say if they saw me going to talk to the prophet, to the man of God? Go hide yourself. This is an attitude we see way too often these days. And I think this is a problem that's been all throughout time. We see this happening here. But we're going to learn a very serious lesson here because we're going to see how God deals with Jeroboam. Don't deceive yourself and trick yourself into thinking that you can put God on some back burner and when everything's going good in your life, you could just forsake God, you could ignore God, you could have nothing to do with God, say, I'm not going to go to church, everything's going fine, and then when something bad happens, all of a sudden, now you're going to turn to God and you're just expecting God to just be there like, like a magic genie in a bottle that you can call on anytime you have something going wrong with you and you just want him to do something for you and expect God to listen. I'm sorry, but that's not the way that God operates. And we need to remember that. We need to humble ourselves and make sure that we don't get lifted up in our own pride and we just put God off and put him in bed. You know, I actually believe that Jeroboam was probably a saved man. I don't know that. I can't, I can't prove that from Scripture one way or the other. He, he definitely got into some serious sins when he built those calves and stuff, but I don't think he was even recognizing them as gods. I think he was just worried about his position. He was worried about his power. He was worried about his, his money and whatever, like that, it, it, which is completely wrong, completely sinful, but doesn't make him unsaved. And we see him here kind of turning back and saying, you know what, I, I need to hear something from God here. But sorry, Jeroboam, it's a little bit uh, too little too late. We need to be seeking after God while he may be found. Amen. Don't think that you can just go and do whatever you want and God's always going to hear you. And all. Now look, is God a long-suffering God? Amen. Yes, he is. Is God a merciful God? Yes, he is. Amen. No matter what you've done in the past, it's always a right thing to turn back to God. Always. I mean, would you just... just even if you've gotten to the point somewhere like Jeroboam and, you know, look, go back to God because you don't know exactly what he's going to do. But what we'll learn from this lesson is don't let yourself get to that point where you've gotten so far away from God and then all of a sudden you want something from him. We never know exactly how gracious and kind and merciful God will be because he is very merciful. But don't push your luck because God is not just going to, you know, fumble all over himself and just be thanking you so much for, for coming back to him when he's already given you warnings and warnings and warnings. I mean, Jeroboam, he had the prophets going to him and telling him, you're wrong. Hey, get, you know, get right with God. He just had the man of God in the last chapter you know, rebuking him and giving him another chance. And he didn't listen to him. You can't depend on waiting in another point. You know, I'm, I'm gearing this more towards if you're saved, but you know, a lot of people have this false notion, too, of that they're not saved, and they think, well, I'll just wait until my deathbed. 
right? I'm going to live up my life. I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm going to, you know, get into all kinds of sin. Whatever feels good, I'm just going to do it. And then, you know what? When, when I'm getting sick and I'm getting old and I know I'm about to die, then I'll just call on Jesus at that moment. That's so wicked. Now, I'm not saying that God is going to not save anybody who actually puts their faith in Jesus Christ. He will. But what a foolish thing yeah. to just wait until the last second. Because you don't know what's going to happen in your life. And you have this plan. What a wicked plan. And you know what? I think most people that have that type of a plan, they don't even understand salvation to begin with. Because yeah. usually the people that have that type of plan are thinking that, well, I want to be saved and go to heaven, but I want to do this other stuff too. I want to, have, I want to, I want to get into all these sins. right? I want, I, want to do the, I want to be a drunk. I want to do drugs. I want you know, whatever the case may be. But they're thinking that in order to be saved, well, I got to stop everything and just live this perfect life and go to church every week. That's not the case. We know that that's not what saves us. The blood of Jesus Christ is what saves us. Once you put your faith in him, you're saved forever. Now, obviously, should you be going out and getting into sin? Of course not. Of course you should be changing your life. Of course you should be doing what's right. But it's not, it's not a prerequisite. It's not a condition that, well, if you want to be saved, you have to just give up all these various sins and then you can be saved. No. The Bible doesn't say that anywhere. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. But, but trying to think that you're going to put off, you know, going to God, put off putting your faith in him just because of whatever is, is, is foolishness. Amen. And if you're saved, you just can't go around and about and do anything you want and then expect God to bail you out of trouble either. The Bible says that we're good that... Um, the Bible says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall, he, that shall he also reap. Don't be deceived. Don't let people trick you into thinking that God's just always, you know, always go to God. He's always there for you. Don't be deceived. If you're going to be going out and sinning and sowing to the wind, you better be prepared to reap the whirlwind. It's coming back to you. Let's keep reading here in verse number four. Because we're going to see how, how, how God literally deals with Jeroboam as he's trying to go and get some information about his son from the prophet. Verse number four, And Jeroboam's wife did so and arose and went to Shiloh and came to the house of Ahijah. But Ahijah could not see, for his eyes were set by reason of his age. And the Lord said unto Ahijah, Behold, the wife of Jeroboam cometh to ask a thing of thee for her son, for he is sick. Thus and thus shalt thou say unto her, for it shall be when she cometh in, that she shall feign herself to be another woman. So God gives Ahijah the heads up here. The, the Lord literally speaks to Ahijah and tells him, hey, Jeroboam's wife's going to come. She's going to disguise herself. And here's what I want you to tell her. She's going to pretend like she's somebody else. And Ahijah, he was blind. Like they're saying, his, his eyes were set by reason of his age, meaning he was basically blind. He was so old, you know, his, his eyes had grown dim. He's not able to see. So he wouldn't have normally been able to distinguish that this is Jeroboam's wife visually. But God tells him, hey, here she comes, and this is what I want you to tell her. So as soon as she gets to the door, look at verse 6, and it was so when Ahijah heard the sound of her feet as she came in at the door, that he said, come in, thou wife of Jeroboam, why feignest thou thyself to be another? For I am sent to thee with heavy tidings. Like right up, she doesn't even have a chance to open up her mouth and say, you know, give her lies of who she is. She's just like, he's like, come on in. You know, I know who you are. Don't, don't fool around. Don't play with God. God knows everything. You can't trick the Lord. Just come on in. I've got some bad news for you. Here's what's going to happen. Verse number seven. Go, tell Jeroboam, thus saith the Lord, God of Israel, for as much as I exalted thee from among the people and made thee prince over my people Israel and rent the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it thee, and yet thou hast not been as my servant David, who kept my commandments and who followed me with all his heart, to do that only which was right in mine eyes, but hast done evil above all that were before thee. For thou hast gone and made thee other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger and hast cast me behind thy back. So he starts off saying, look, I'm the one that promoted you. I'm the one that got you to the position that you're in. I'm the one that gave you the kingdom. I took it away from David. I gave it to you. And you go and you make these false gods. He literally made up some new gods. He has created these calves and say, these be thy gods. Worship them. And he's like, you've just completely tossed me behind your back. Like, I'm nothing to you. 
And I gave you all this stuff, so here's what he's going to do. Verse number 10, therefore, so because of these things, because that's the way that he treated God, therefore, behold, I will bring evil upon the house of Jeroboam and will cut off from Jeroboam him that pisseth against the wall and him that is shut up and left in Israel and will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam as a man taketh away dung till it be all gone. So Jeroboam was just trying to find out about his son that was sick. He hears about a lot more than just his son. He's saying, your whole house. When it says, him that pisseth against the wall, that's all the male children, all the descendants of Jeroboam. Any man that would be able to carry on his seed, his line, his name, God says, I'm, I'm wiping them all out. They're all going to be gone. And not only just dead, but he says, I'm going to take away the remnant. It's like the remainder of the house of Jeroboam. As a man taketh away dung. That's not a fun job. I mean, it's a stinky job, literally, taking away dung. Just You're the guy that just, just disposes of the dung. That's what, that's what the king's house, going from all the way at the top, top of the food chain, I'm the king. You don't get much you don't get any higher than that as a man, all the way down to the dung hill. God knows how to exalt, and God knows how to abase. He could lift you up from nothing, and he could take you down to nothing like that. We need to remember that. Don't mess with God. Don't think you could just throw him to the side or, or you know, push him off for a while. I don't have anything to do with God. Treat God with respect. Let's see verse number 11. It says, Him that dieth of Jeroboam in the city shall the dogs eat, and him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat, for the Lord hath spoken. He's, they're not even going to get proper burials. He said they're going to die, and the, they're just going to be left for the animals to just, just devour their bodies and... and, and that's what's going to happen to him. No peace, no closure. Everything's just, you know, some of the, the worst, some of the worst things you could imagine for your own household. Verse number 12. Arise thou therefore, get thee to thine own house, and when thy feet enter into the city, the child shall die. And all Israel shall mourn for him and bury him. For he only of Jeroboam shall come to the grave. Because in him... There is found some good thing toward the, God, toward the Lord, God of Israel, in the house of Jeroboam. Moreover, the Lord shall raise him up a king over Israel, who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam that day. But what? Even now. So he's saying that the, uh, the, the child that he went to inquire of, that's sick, he's saying that's the only one in the house of Jeroboam that God even sees any good in at all. He's saying, you know what? This, this son... He's got a little bit of good in him, and, and just for that reason, I'm going to allow him, he, you know, he's going to die, I'm going to allow him to die and be buried, and, and Israel's going to mourn for him. But everyone else is going to just be left out to the field, left for the birds, left for the dogs to just eat their flesh. At least his one son is going to have somewhat of a respectable death, and, and people are going to grieve for him and mourn for him. He says, but not everyone else. And he's saying, I'm going to raise up another king and they're going to cut off your whole house. Verse number 15. For the Lord shall smite Israel as a reed is shaken in the water and he shall root up Israel out of this good land which he gave to their fathers and shall scatter them beyond the river because they made their groves provoking the Lord to anger and he shall give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam who did sin and who made Israel to sin. This is kind of interesting. I just want to point this out real briefly because we live in a, in a, in a, in a Christian society now in churches, in many churches, there's these people want to lift up Israel, like this, the physical nation of Israel, as if there's something special. You know, people say, oh, they're God's chosen people. We need to bless Israel in order for God to bless us. And the truth couldn't be farther from, from that statement. That is, that is such a, a bastardization of Scripture and ripping things out of context that don't make any sense. I mean, when you read the Bible, and I bring this up because this is just one more time that this happens. People want to live, it's, it's, like, it's like history doesn't happen. They go from Abraham to today. They say, oh, God made these promises to Abraham. Said, you know, Whoever's going to bless thee, I'm going to bless them. And whoever curses you, I'm going I'm to curse him. And he says thee both times, by the way, because he's talking to Abraham as a, as a man, as a person, not all of his descendants for all time, forevermore. 
But they want to take that and then just say, oh, and here we are today. As if the whole time frame, if anyone ever blessed, anyone descended physically from Abraham all the way up to today, then they're going to be blessed and everyone else is going to be cursed. Look, God himself, look at what it says. Look at verses 15. For the Lord shall smite Israel. He's the one that's going to be bringing evil upon him. As a reed is shaken in the water, and he shall be able to root up Israel out of his good land, which he gave to their father, and shall scatter them beyond the river, because they gave, they have made their groves, provoking the Lord to anger, and he shall give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam who did sin and who made Israel to sin. So at this time in history, because this is way after Abraham, right? If, if that supposed promise is supposed to stand, oh, if anyone blesses Israel, they're going to be blessed. Imagine that you have, you see how angry God gets here, first of all, about Israel. And all he's going to do for her for going after strange gods. If someone at this time were to just bless Israel, man, you're great, you're awesome, I'm going to support you and all that you do as God is bringing evil upon them, do you think God's going to bless that person? For just, you, you blessed Israel, good job. Then why would it be any different today? Are the people in the land of Israel, by and large, worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ? No. They've got their false God. It's not Jehovah. It's not the Lord. Jesus Christ said, if you believe Moses, you'd believe me. They're, they don't believe him. They don't believe the Lord. They've got a different God. So why should we think that we need to bless this physical nation of Israel, bless these people that are living there, that are antichrist, that deny the Christ, that deny the, the, the only begotten Son of the Father, and just say, well, we have to bless them because God said that whoever blesses Abraham is going to be blessed. It's foolishness and it's nonsense. And it doesn't match up with any of the rest of Scripture. Folks, we've got to take the whole Bible in context and look at everything and, and analyze. When someone makes claims and statements like that, let's see what the book actually says. Okay, does it stand up to scrutiny? And here's this, and this is like, I mean, I've never even thought of to use this as some text verse, you know, to, to, to disprove that. This is just another of many, many, many times that God is bringing judgment against Israel. And those claims do not hold water at all. I just wanted to point that out. Let's keep reading here because that's, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on that. Verse number 17. And Jeroboam's wife arose and departed and came to Terza. And when she came to the threshold of the door, the child died. So again, immediately, ju just like Ahai just said, as soon as you get into the city, as soon as you get there, that baby's going to die. It says, she came to Tirzah, and when she came to the threshold of the door, the child died. And they buried him, and all Israel mourned for him according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by the hand of his servant Ahijah the prophet. And the rest of the acts of Jeroboam, how he warred and how he reigned, behold, they are written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel. And the days which Jeroboam reigned were two and twenty years, and he slept with his fathers, and Nadab his son reigned in his stead. So we see here, just how did God deal with him? How did God deal with Jeroboam? When he finally decided to go and seek out God and seek out godly advice and see, and see, well, what does God have for me now? What does God have for my son? My son's sick. I'm having problems. What's going on? Now I'm going to go back to God. What does God do? The best he did for him is say, you know what? Your son's actually going to be buried in a grave. He's going to die, but he's going to be that, that's, that's what you get. He's going to be buried in a grave. And the whole rest of your house is going to be cut off. It was too late for Jeroboam. And we need to remember that. Don't ever get caught off in this thing where you think that I, I always have time. I can always go back. I can always make things okay. No, you can't. Sometimes maybe you can. And we always ought to be going back to God. But keep that in mind that God is not your genie. He's not there to answer every wish that you have, no matter what you do, no matter what goes on in your life, and you can just always go to him, and he's always just going to listen to you and just give you whatever you want. It's not the case. Verse number 21. The Bible says, And Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 40 and one years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord did choose out of all the tribes of Israel put his name there, and his mother's name was Naamah and Ammonitus. Now, this is, I, I didn't bring this up earlier when we're going through Solomon, 
uh, Solomon's reign and his life and stuff. If you remember way back when, when Solomon prayed unto God, when Solomon became king, and he had asked God, he said, you know, I'm, I'm just a child. He said, you know, teach me. I don't know how to go out and to come in. He was asking God for wisdom. He had that, make, that great prayer to God. When God asked him, what do you want? And he says, just give me wisdom. I need to be able to lead this people. I need to, to be able to be a righteous judge of this land. And, and I want to do what's right in your eyes. It's, you know, obviously, I'm, I'm summarizing what he was saying. But um, God, uh, God loved that. He blessed that. But when he said that he was a child, he wasn't literally like a 12-year-old. And this is another proof here is that it says that Rehoboam was 41 years old when he began to reign. Well, Solomon's reign was 40 years, which means that Rehoboam was born one year prior to Solomon being the king, right? So he at least had to be of age to be able to have children at the time he began to reign. And, and I had mentioned before, he's probably like in his 20s or something like that uh, when, when he actually did become king. But, so he wasn't just some child. He was just using that expression that he was a child because he was being humble and just saying, look, I, I'm, I'm really young. You know, I, I don't really know a lot about being a king and ruling, so God, I need your help. And again, that's the type of attitude that we should all have. God, I really need your help. You know, there's a lot of things I don't know. I don't have a lot of wisdom. God, please just help me to do these types of jobs or whatever it is that you have for me to do. Um, anyways, let's keep reading here. I just wanted to point that out because I didn't bring this, this verse up when, we were, when I was talking about that previously in weeks past. Verse number 22, And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with all their sins which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. For they also built them high places and images and groves on every high hill and under every green tree. And there were also Sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And this is what we're going to spend probably the rest of the time focusing on tonight. It's never a pleasant subject, but I think it's extremely important in the day and age that we live in with the, with the society, with the LGBTQ, LMNOP, whatever the, the, the acronyms they want to use these days of sodomites, filthy sodomites, okay? Let's not, let's not you know, I, I don't know, let's not call them gay because gay means happy, okay? They're, they're, they're perverts, they're disgusting. They're sodomites. And we're going to look at what the Bible describes about this. And this is a point that we cannot read over. And this is something that you're going to find in every single reference of the sodomites. It says, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before our children of Israel. The sodomites did all of those abominations that the people that were in the land before the Israelites had done. Let's turn to Leviticus chapter 20 and give you an idea of what some of the things were, the abominations that were being done in the land before God brought uh, the children of Israel in to take over the land. So important. We cannot forget this. We cannot let these things slip by. When you, when you read, you know, th these are some of the things. The way that God had brought the children of Israel out of Egypt and into the land of Canaan and destroyed all the nations, this is one of the stumbling blocks that people have to even believe the Bible. Because they read something like this and they say, or they hear about it, they usually don't read it. They hear someone else bring up an objection and they say, how could a loving God command that men, women, and children all be destroyed. This is, this is an argument, and I've heard it many, many times. This is something that people just don't quite get. And I'll admit, you know, so it, I just especially coming out of this world and all the brainwashing that's coming at you from all angles and the world's philosophy, that could be a difficult thing to grasp and to understand. But we're going to read all of Leviticus chapter 20 to get a small idea of what is going on and how literally toxic the, the, the people had become in that land where God just said, you know what? The only solution at this point is to just wipe them all out because we don't need any more remnant of the wicked culture and society that was living there then. They've gone beyond repair. It just needs to be taken out. That was God's solution, by the way, in Sodom and Gomorrah. 
It was no more fixing. It was fire and brimstone being poured out from heaven and just saying, they've gone too far. It's just too much. They're just too wicked. The prayers have gone up to heaven and he sent his angels to see whether or not those things that he had heard were so. And guess what? They were. He saved Lot and whoever would go with Lot and his family and poured out fire and brimstone on the rest. There was not five, there was not ten righteous people in that city. But when we see all the various just perversions and filth, it gives you a little bit better understanding. So this is what was going on. Now it's starting to make a little bit more sense why God commanded. Because he didn't look, and by the way, Israel, the children of Israel, God's people, however you want to call them, have had wars and battles with other people in, 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 in many times throughout history. They were never commanded just to wipe everybody out, though, like they were when they came into the land. And they were, they were called out by name which ones were going to be destroyed and wiped off the face of the earth. And it's because of the abominations that they did. It's not because of anything else. It's not because God's a racist. It's not because he just felt like it. God was bringing judgment upon extremely wicked people while he was simultaneously fulfilling prophecies that were promised unto Abraham and other people you know, after him, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let's read Leviticus 20. Look at verse number one. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel, that giveth any of his seed unto Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. And I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he hath given of his seed unto Molech to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. And if the people of the land do anyways hide their eyes from the man which he giveth of his seed unto Molech and kill him not, then I will set my face against that man and against his family and will cut him off and all that go whoring after him to commit whoredom with Molech from among their people. So it starts right off by saying that these people were, were performing child sacrifice. They were literally taking their children, their newborn children, and burning them in the fire. The Bible says they, they, they passed them through the fire unto Molech. They burned an infant alive. I mean, how much more perverted and sick can you be than burning a little baby alive and saying, here's for you, God, is Molech. It, it turns my stomach to even think about that and just to, to, to realize the reality of what was going on at that time. They were literally taking babies and burning them. That's how chapter 20 starts off. And it doesn't get much better from there. Look at verse number 6. And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards who go a whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. Sanctify yourselves therefore and be ye holy for I am the Lord your God. And you shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord, which sanctify you. For everyone that curseth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. He hath cursed his father or his mother. The, his blood shall be upon him. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. And the man that lieth with his father's wife hath uncovered his father's nakedness. Both of them shall surely be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. And if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have wrought confusion, their blood shall be upon them. So he's getting into all these various, you know, sins of a sexual nature, you know, adultery and, and lying with your neighbor's wife, lying with your father's wife or with your 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 daughter-in-law what you know just all these various things where people just can't control themselves anymore and their actions and who they're going to go to bed with and then it gets even and then it just continues on here down the same path you have adultery going on you've got people in, in close relationships that should never be getting involved with each other get involved with each other verse 13 says if a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman both of them have committed an abomination they shall surely be put to death their blood shall be upon them and if a man take a wife and her mother it is wickedness they shall be burnt with fire both he and they they 
that were, excuse me, that there be no wickedness among you. And if a man lie with a beast, he shall surely be put to death, and you shall slay the beast. And if a woman approach unto any beast and lie down there too, thou shalt kill the woman and the beast. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. These are the abominable things that have been, were being done in the land. When the Bible says these things are an abomination, 1 Kings 14, 24 said, And there were also sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. All the abominations. Let's keep reading here, Leviticus 20. There's, because there's so much of this. I don't even want to focus on any one of them. There's so many things that were going on. Verse 17, And if a man shall take his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, and see her nakedness, and she see his nakedness, it is a wicked thing, and they shall be cut off in the sight of their of their people, he hath uncovered his sister's nakedness, he shall bear his nakedness. Now, when we see this uncovering of nakedness, this is a euphemism. This is talking about more than just like you accidentally walked into the bedroom and you saw your brother or your sister naked. That's not what this is referring to. The Bible is just using a lighter language to let you know, hey, this is referring to something else, but it's using it in, in, in language that can be preached for children to hear, for anyone to hear. Because the word of God is pure. Verse 18, And if a man shall lie with a woman having her sickness, and shall uncover her nakedness, he hath discovered her fountain, and she hath uncovered the fountain of her blood, and both of them shall be cut off from among their people. And thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister, nor of thy father's sister, for he uncovereth his near kin. They shall bear their iniquity. And if a man shall lie with his uncle's wife, he hath uncovered his uncle's nakedness. They shall bear their sin, and they shall die childless. And if a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. He hath uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall be childless. You shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and do them, that the land whither I bring you to dwell therein spew you not out. And ye shall not walk in the manners of the nation which I cast out before you. Look at this. For they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. He's listing all of these various things, and he says, you know what? The nations that were here before you, because he doesn't give them the land, he's saying they did all these things. They did all of these things. And I ab abhor is a very strong word for hate. He hated them. He said, I abhorred them because of all these things that they did. Verse 24, but I have said unto you, you shall inherit their land and I will give it unto you to possess it, a land that floweth with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, which have separated you from other people. You shall therefore put difference between clean beasts and unclean. And between unclean fowls and clean, and ye shall not make your souls abominable by beast or by fowl or by any manner of living thing that creepeth on the ground, which I have separated from you as unclean. And ye shall be holy unto me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have severed you from other people that ye should be mine. A man also or woman that a familiar spirit or that is a wizard shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. There's a lot of things that you see in this. And this is only one chapter of God's law. Now, this is, I think, like the most extreme, like the most weird, the most perverted, the most disgusting things that you could think of. Like, why does this even have to be written in the law? Shouldn't that just be common sense? That we don't lie down with animals and you don't go after the, you know, men with men and women with women. This is just like, why, why do we even have to say that? But you do. And God did. And he said, one of the reasons why I'm writing it down is because they did all these things. All of these things. And I hated them. As a result. And, in, and go back to 1 Kings 14. In 1 Kings 14, 24, it's not a mistake when the Bible says there were also sodomites in the land. And they did, who? The Sodomites did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. This is inherently what Sodomites are and what they do. This is the characteristic of a Sodomite. No, it's not just one or two or a few. The Sodomites, all the Sodomites, these are their characteristics. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 1. The Bible is consistent. It is no coincidence that every mention of, of the Sodomite is not only bad. It's not just a negative reference. It's not just like Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, when he's referenced, is in a bad light. It's way worse than that. The mentions of the Sodomites is not only bad, their behavior is like the worst that exists in the Bible. The worst things, the worst stories that you read of people doing just unimaginable things, it's always the Sodomites. 
Always. Genesis chapter 9. You have the story. You don't have to turn there. Just, you can write these down and look up these stories. Genesis chapter 9, you got the story of Noah after the flood. He gets drunk in his tent, and what does his son do? Ham comes in, and he says he uncovers his father's nakedness. You know what? That's another euphemism. And if you don't believe me, that when Moses, or when, excuse me, when, no, not Moses, when Noah curses him, when Noah curses his son, he says he cursed him because of what he had done unto him. Not because of what he saw, not because he didn't walk in backwards, because of what he had done unto him. That's the first, that's the first sign we see a sodomite. Genesis 19, of course, is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis chapter 19. Go read that one and see how pleasant that story is. When, the whole, when all the men of the city compassed about when the angels came into town because they wanted to rape and sodomize the angels that came into Lot's house. Because that's what they were after and that's what they're all about. And the more of them there are, the more bold they get and the more they're going to come out and get in your face and take what they want. You can see that attribute in them today. When they get very vocal about things and, and, and get real pushy. They want to shove their filth down your throat. And the only reason why they're not coming and surrounding people's houses yet is because there's not enough of them. They don't physically have the power to do that yet. In Sodom, they did. And once they have enough strength, enough people, they'll do it. Don't think they won't. Don't think they're just cute. Don't think that's just a lifestyle and that's just, they just want to love and, and whatever. The world's brainwashing you. Judges 19, if Genesis 19 doesn't convince you, Judges 19 will. Judges 19 is a story of the man where, that, that is traveling back with his concubine. He goes into one of the towns of the city of, of, of the, the people, Benjamin. Comes across an old man. He's looking for a place to stay. He's like, look, we got money. We got everything. I just need somewhere to stay. And, uh, and, well, and the old man, we couldn't find anyone, so he was just going to stay in the street. He's like, okay, well, fine, we'll set up camp out here. We're going we're gonna to sleep in this town, and we're going to be out, and we'll be out later. The old man finds him. He's like, no, 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 don't stay out in the street. You come into my house. I'll take care of you. Comes into the house. What happens? People come to the door, just like in Sodom. And what did they want? They wanted the man. They wanted to abuse him. They wanted to do, you know, do bad things unto him just like they wanted to do the angels in Sodom. And what happened? They foolishly threw out his concubine, right? They fed her to the dogs. And they were saying, well, it's better than, than them defiling a man to give her a woman. But that's still, that's still wickedness. They shouldn't have given her, given her anybody. Should have prayed unto God and asked God to protect them and fight, off, fight them off to the last bitter end. I mean, that's... That's what they should have done. But what happened was they gave him the concubine and they abused her all night, the Bible says, until they killed her. They abused her to death. These are your sodomites. This is what the Bible portrays as a sodomite. It doesn't get worse than that. Look through Scripture. It's no surprise. You're in Romans chapter 1. Look at Romans chapter 1. We're going to see more support for what I'm teaching tonight, for what the Bible's teaching tonight, for what we saw in 1 Kings 14, that they had done, the Sodomites in the land had done according to all the abominations. All the abominations we read in Leviticus 20, Romans chapter 1 gives us an explanation of this and says essentially the same exact thing. We'll start reading here in verse number 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. We're at, we're, everybody's without excuse today. You could tell by nature alone that God exists. You could understand the, the truth in the Godhead just by what is around us. People are without excuse. It says, verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. They knew about God. They heard about God. When they knew him, they glorified him not as God. They rejected him and decided to make up their own gods. As it says in verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. 
Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Before we go on here in Romans chapter 1, notice the, what's happening. There's a people that they hear about God. They know about God. They're without excuse. But when they hear him, they reject it. They say, you know what? No, I don't like that God. I don't have anything to do with that God. I'm going to make up my own God. I'm going to make this idol. I'm going to make this image. I'm going to make this God. And, and they get lifted up in their own pride and their own knowledge. They think they're so smart, professing themselves to be wise. They became fools. And isn't it interesting because in 1 Kings chapter 14, what had happened just previously? The false gods were set up. The creature was created and worshipped as a god. They made golden calves. You see, it's, it's the same way every time. Every time without fail. We see the same pattern. This is how it works. God's word's true. I don't, we, we just see it happening and getting played out over and over and over again. So we saw up to this point, Romans chapter 1, they're creating their false gods. They rejected God. They know him. They don't have anything to do with them. Verse 26, for this, God, for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. Vile is dirty. Vile is disgusting. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. God made us with a natural use. God made men and women to have a natural use. What you're naturally inclined to do. Natural, you know, naturally, we will sin. Naturally, you might be tempted to steal. Naturally, you might lie. Naturally, a man is going to lie with a woman. And naturally, a woman's going to lie with a man. Because that is what God has given to us by nature to do. But when you get to this point... When you've refused God, when you've rejected God, when you've built up your own God, and you've given up on God, and you've rejected Him, and you've never accepted the truth of God, you get to the point where it says here, God gave them up. So you're going to give up on me, I'm going to give up on you. And He gave them up unto vile affections to do all these things that they wouldn't normally do naturally. He gave them these desires. He gave them up unto these vile affections to do these things, to do this wicked thing that t turns the stomach of any normal human being. Verse 27, And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust, one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Reprobate means rejected. They've been rejected. It's part of the theme for what we saw in 1 Kings 14. You know what? There does come a time when it could be too late to get saved. People teach. I've heard people say it's never too late to get saved. You know what? For a lot of people, that may be true. But for some people, it is too late to get saved. When you know God and you glorify Him not as God, when you worship and serve the creature more than creator is blessed forever, when you do not like to retain God in your knowledge, when you just, just push him out and you hate God, it gets a point where God will just say, fine. I mean, think about it. The Bible says that if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you have never forgiveness. There's an example of one group of people that can never be saved. It's too late for them. You blaspheme the Holy Ghost, the Bible says it's too late. You never have forgiveness, not in this world, neither in the world to come. Not going to happen. Bible talks about people who receive the mark of the beast. Everybody who takes the mark of the beast, which hasn't happened yet, everyone who takes that mark of the beast, though, they're going to hell. So you can't tell me there's going to be a person that takes the mark of the beast and then ends up going to heaven, or else the Bible's wrong. It's too late for them. Once they take the mark of the beast, that's done. And likewise, like it says in Revelation 22, you, you change the word of God, you start adding, taking away and adding to God's word. He takes away your power out of the book of life. He says, no more. You can't be saved. It's too late for those people. And the people that, that just reject God, reject God, want nothing to do with God, you know what? It's too late for them too. We may not always know who they are. We don't know who the people are. But there are symptoms, there are signs of people that we do know have gone too far because God's already given them over to the reprobate mind. And it's evidenced by them doing these things that are not natural, that are not normal. 
that know, you know, naturally, as I mentioned earlier, naturally we're inclined to sin. Naturally we're inclined to do stealing and other things, but we're not naturally inclined to go off and be a sodomite. That is not natural. And if someone's doing that, if someone has this burning in their lust, one towards another, that is a sign, that is a symptom of, of God has already given that person over. It's already done. But this is what I really wanted to point out here. These last few verses in, in Romans chapter 1. Because the, the point that I was drawing from was in 1 Kings chapter 14 when it said that the Sodomites did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. All the abominations. Well, look at how it describes the person given over to the reprobate mind who also is a sodomite because they're burning their lust one towards another. Men with men, women with women. Verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness. The very first phrase in verse 29, they're filled. This is an attribute of the reprobate. They're filled with all unrighteousness. All these verses are describing the reprobate. All of them apply. Because people like to say this and say, oh, well, you've done this sin or you've done that sin in this list. No, 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 that's not the point. That's not what this verse, these verses are saying. It's not saying that, that some of them do one thing or this thing. No, they do all of these things. This is what encompasses a sodomite. Being filled with all unrighteousness. All means all, folks. Fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness. Full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they that commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. They actually like it. They enjoy it. They like being wicked. They like their filth. They enjoy it, and they have pleasure in other people that do it too. What a sick, twisted, perverted, reprobate mind to be taking pleasure in all of these various sins and horrible things that people can do and just loving it when other people do it too. This is why you have the gay pride parade. Because they flaunt their wickedness and their filth for everyone to see. They're happy about it. Gross. People want to say, oh, but I know this one person. And see, this is why this type of preaching doesn't fly today. Because more and more people... I've got a cousin. I've got a son. I've got an uncle. I've got, a, you know, whoever... That's a sodomite. And look, if that's you tonight, I'm sorry that you have that in your family. That sucks. But I'm not going to change the Word of God, and I'm going to preach the Word of God, and we're going to stand on the Word of God, and people need to get this attitude, and I don't want more people to be deceived, thinking that, oh, this is just fine. Oh, this is just a lifestyle. Oh, I know this person. They would never hurt anybody. If they're a sodomite, yes, they would. It's just a matter of time. Guaranteed. It's just a matter of time. I believe the Bible more than, than your friend. Amen. Amen. And this is, this is, I tried to explain this to someone one time who, they weren't a sodomite or anything. They were, trying, they were trying to figure this thing out. And they said that they knew someone. I said, well, how much time do you spend with your friend? Even if you hang out with someone. I had friends who hung out with all the time. Even my best friends that I spent the most time with growing up or whatever, even my wife, who I, I've never spent more time with anybody in my whole life other than like my own family, than my wife. I mean, we're together all the time. But even with her, there's times when we're not together. There's times when we're apart. There's a lot of time where, where there can be spent doing other things that she doesn't know anything about or that I don't know anything about. Or, you know, and when it comes to people saying, oh, I have this friend, yeah, how much time do you not spend with them? The Bible talks a lot about people who are wolves in sheep's clothing. There's a lot of people that put on a front. And you think about the kids that get defiled, that get molested. Who are the ones that are end up get, being guilty of that? Sodomites. They're sodomites, but they're the ones that no one ever thought of. Right? Oh, Uncle so and -so? No, he loved them. I mean, I, I can't believe it. And how many times do they not even get prosecuted or in, in trouble at all because the family just doesn't believe it? Because the child says something and it's like, no, no, you just didn't understand it. Oh, no, you know, he would never do something like that. Right. 
because they put on a front. They put on a show. They make everybody think that they're just fine and they're normal and they're great. But inside, they are toxic and rotten to the core. And they know how to hide it well. But that, the Bible exposes what's in their heart. And I believe God's word way more than your example of a friend that you have that they're not any of these things. Yeah, right. You go ahead and call God a liar. I'm not going to do it. Amen. Second Peter 2 explains that God was letting the world know what he thought about the Sodomites for all generations. We said even as Sodom and Gomorrah um, going after strange flesh, they were, they were an example for those that should follow afterwards. When he, when he rained down the fire and brimstone. And, I, and I'm not quoting that exactly, but look it up later, 2 Peter chapter 2. Now, I also want to point out that it mentions in 1 Kings, go back if you would to 1 Kings chapter um, 14. I want to point out that it mentions there were sodomites in the land. Well, why were there sodomites in the land? We just read in Leviticus chapter 20 that they were supposed to be being put to death. Why were there Sodomites in the land? Because the, God's law wasn't being, being adhered to. It was not put in place. It may have been, but they had forsaken it. Now, had they been executing them, they wouldn't be in the land. I think it's harder, and, I think it's, and this is what I think, and I think this is where it starts from. I think it was harder for Solomon to be a righteous judge when he's the one that had a thousand wives and concubines. He had already started to go down this, this path of this perversion, right? We, we saw it kind of getting worse and worse, even as we read through Leviticus chapter 20. We see this happen time and time again as, as people start opening up the door to more and more wickedness, more and more perversion, things kind of, you know, instead of just being one man, one woman, God made Adam and Eve, you know, the, 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 for this cause shall man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. You know, two people coming together, union, marriage, Done. You have a family, and that's the way that God designed it. And then you start going off, and your eyes start wandering, and then you say, well, I want to have multiple wives. Well, I want to have, now I want to have concubines that aren't even really my wife, just kind of these living girls. I just want to have all these women around. And they start, you know, getting farther and farther out of control of being, what's being acceptable. And if you imagine the kings doing this, what do you think the rest of the people that are, that are seeing this happen, they're going to say, oh, well, if it's okay for him. Then you start saying, well, now all of a sudden we're just not even married anymore. I mean, Solomon had all these wives, right? But it's like, well, he's got so many. I mean, what's, what does marriage even mean anymore? And, and, and you just follow this downward spiral until things just start to get out of control as far as what's considered acceptable and normal and fine in a society. Until it gets to the point to where you've got sodomites in the land because people have just gotten more and more perverted. And more and more just, just going, giving, being, giving themselves over to fornication. That's actually what it says in Jude. In Jude verse 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. When a people, a nation, start to accept fornication, is okay. Adultery is okay. Multiple, you know, whatever. All of this very stuff. And they, they give themselves over to this fornication to their flesh. It's not going to be that long you start seeing the sodomites start and pop up. Because you, get, you, you have the majority of people kind of sticking within their wickedness, but you're always going to have people pushing it further and further and further down the road and, and getting more and more wicked. And I think this is where it ends up. 1 Kings 14. Let's finish out this chapter. Th those are the main points I wanted to cover tonight. It, it is important. It's not, a, it's not a fun subject. I don't like, it's not like I like preaching on this. But every time it comes up in the Bible, we're doing a Bible study, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point it out. And I'm going to scream and yell about it because things have gotten out of control in the United States of America. And not just the United States of America, within the churches of the United States of America, within people who claim to believe God's word and have gotten afraid to even mention the name Sodomite or the word Sodomite. 
because they're afraid of offending people that might have a relative that's a sodomite. I'm not going to withhold the truth from you. Like I said, if you have a sodomite in your family somewhere, I'm sorry for you. That's really too bad. It's terrible. But I'm not going to withhold any bit of truth. Amen. Not for one second. Let's finish off this chapter. Verse number 25. And it came to pass in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem and he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He even took away all. And he took away all the shields of gold which Solomon had made. Look how quickly from Solomon had everything glorious in his kingdom. He made, he, he had, they had so much money they made these shields of gold. right? I mentioned that when we were going over Solomon's reign and the wealth and everything that was going on there. In less than a generation, his son takes the throne. All of a sudden, they're trouble. Now, all their stuff's taken away. Why? Because God wasn't protecting them anymore. Why? Because they turned from the Lord. Because they stopped following. Because they were building these idols. They were, they were worshiping, setting up altars and images and everything else. And, and worshiping in the high places and doing all the things that God told them not to do. So what happens? They're going to get judged. Verse 27, And King Rehoboam made in their stead brazen shields and committed them unto the hands of the chief of the guard, which kept the door of the king's house. And it was so when the king went into the house of the Lord that the guard bare them and brought them back into the guard chamber. Notice how now they're not going to be resting easy at all. In Solomon's days, when everything was going good, when everyone was worshiping the Lord, when, before he got into the sin, there was peace. There was comfort. They, you know, that would have been the era where you could have left your, your screen door open all night, right? And gone to bed in peace and not worry. Why? Because the Lord's protecting you. Because you didn't have anything to worry about. Now he's living in the days, well, let's lock up the door. Oh, we, got, we can't even carry around golden shields anymore. We're going to make them out of brass. And we're going to carry them in. We're going to lock them up. We're going to put them away. And then we're going to bring them back out again. And we just need to keep everything locked up because things have just gotten more wicked. Why? Because we turned the, the, the people started turning from the Lord. Verse 29, Now the rest of the acts of Rehoboam and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all their days. And Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And his mother's name was Naamah and Ammonitus. And Abijam his son reigned in his stead. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for um, providing uh, providing your words for us today, dear Lord, for preserving your words for us today in 2017, that we could rely on uh, this Bible that we have in our hands to be your words, that we could look to them for all truth, all wisdom, all knowledge. God, we pray for you just to continue to open up your words to us. Help us not to be brainwashed by the, the, the current culture by the current media, by the TV, by everything else around us, dear Lord, by the satanic influences that are all about us. Help us to maintain a, a pure thought. Help us to renew our minds by staying in your word, dear Lord, and not having preconceived ideas and not letting our emotions rule us, but, but seeking out the truth from your word honestly with an honest heart that, that we can just receive What's written in the Bible is the word of God because it's truly what it is and that we could just accept your words and, um, and base everything in our life literally off of your words, dear Lord. We thank you so much and we love you and we thank you for making salvation so easy but that it's, it's a free gift through the, the precious blood of your son. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.